face was And I wagged my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone But Jesus, you pay my pay Scott and welcome to RPAC Online. The countdown has begun. There will be this week and one more week online before we go back to church to be church. That's on the 7th of November. But we are still RPAC, we are still God's people, even scattered around our suburbs in Sydney. And you know, we might be scattered, we might be strangers to each other, we may not have anything in common as has been the case with Christians down through the ages. But if we believe in Christ, we're united to Him. We're joined to Him. Our hope for life after death is in Him, and so our life of unity with each other is in Him as well. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, For if we've been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. That's what believing in Christ means. It means unity with Christ. His death is the death of our sin. His resurrection is our resurrection after death. That's what believing in Christ means, unity with Christ. Have a look what God's word says about it in Ephesians. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now that's both comforting and challenging as we consider our shared faith in God, regardless of who we are or where we're from, and no matter how far apart we are physically, we are united. And that's why we should keep the unity of the Spirit. So as we look forward to returning to church on November 7th, there's an encouragement and a challenge. No matter where you're at, whether you can be there on the 7th or not, whether you're vaccinated or not, whether you're excited or nervous or terrified about coming back to church, by faith we are saved by being united with Christ. And by faith we're united to each other in Christ as well. We're united. It's all good. Now our challenge is to keep this unity. 
Our church gathering on the 7th of November will be a smaller version of what we already have in Christ. A small version of what we're looking forward to when Christ returns, as we stand together united, body and soul, with all Christians throughout all time, throughout all ages, in the kingdom of heaven. So bring on November 7th. One other exciting thing is that our Just For Starters group is starting up again. Um, In groups of about 10 people um, over seven weeks, we'll be covering seven basic foundational topics in the Christian life. Um, It's great for people getting back to church. It's great for new Christians. And it's great for anyone who's interested in learning more. Get in touch with RPAC through the website or directly with me. Right now, though, we're going to continue our tour through the senses. That's the kids' spot that I actually really love. Um, Then Britt will lead us in prayer, read the Bible for us before Dan takes us through Psalm 146. And then I'll see you again at the end of the service. Enjoy. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Wow, Annie, you're really strong. Look at that. But you know that, Annie, today our psalm, talks about our, one of our senses. It talks about touch, and it tells us that God is even stronger than Annie. Let me read it for you. Psalm 144 says this. Let me find it. It says, Part your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemies. Shoot your arrows and rout them out. Reach down your hand from on high, deliver me, and rescue me. Touch the mountains. Our God is so strong. This psalm was written by King David, it's believed. And David, he was a great soldier, and he was the king of Israel. This guy had so much power. But when he really needed it, he turned to God, because he knew God was the source of real power. And he asked God for help. Now notice that God is hugely powerful and strong and mighty, yet he guides us with a soft touch because he loves us and he looks after us. And in those weights, have you got them? Yep. You know, these weights, they can make your arm muscles really strong and then you could be super, super strong in your arms. But this one, this one is even better than that one. The Bible can bring us to the source of real strength. Our God who is watching us and who touches us with strength and power but with gentleness. Let's have a go at that one. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start by praying and then we will read together. Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we gather together online, we want to start our prayer of praise from Psalm 146, which states, Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise you, Lord of my life. I will sing praise to you, God, as long as I live. Lord God, let us lift our hearts in praise to you this morning. We praise you for the good news of Christ and for its saving work in bringing people in relationship with you. We praise you for the continuing power and presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives and the way it's transforming us to be more like you. We praise you for your redeeming work in bringing many to know you as we praise you for your faithfulness and love. Lord, remember your grace, mercy and love towards your people. Forgive us of our sins and our rebellious ways. Do not remember our recent pride, our hurtful words, our poor attention to you and to others, our laziness and our desire to be the rulers of our own lives. We confess together the wrongs we have done and the good we have left undone. For the sake of your name, forgive us, Lord. For as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Guide us in your truth, God, for our hope is in you. Lord, help us in our relationships with others. Help us to nurture faith and encouragement with our families, friends and community. Help us to live faithfully with those around us 
and let the gospel shine in our lives as a light in a dark world. Lord, care for those who are in difficult relationships, for those who are looking for work, for those who are ill and for those who are lonely or suffering. We pray for your, your blessing over these people and allow us to care for them. Lord, we pray for your blessing over the school children as they return back this coming week. Bless the teachers too as they return and provide them with peace and comfort during these uncertain times. Lord, be with Mia and Bridget in particular as they complete their HSE. Please give them clarity of mind and peace that only comes from you. Thank you for their persistence in such a difficult year and Lord, bless them with great rest once their exams are over. Lord, we ask you for your blessing over our leaders and for those in positions of authority. Allow them to make wise decisions that are honouring to you. Lord, we don't know the future and we can be so quick to seek control and to become anxious and worried. But Lord, we know you and we know that you have all things in your hands and everything is in your control. What comfort that is to us, God, and let us be reminded of that daily. Lord, we pray for Christians around the world this morning. We pray for those in other countries, especially where they're suffering, danger and persecution. Please keep them safe and may your word change many lives. We pray for the Christians in our country and for our church here in Australia. We pray for our Archbishop, Kanishka Raphael, that you may strengthen and uphold him in his role. Lord, fill your ministers with your spirit so that they can faithfully preach the gospel. Continue to unify us as a church, both here at ARPAC, but also worldwide. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Lord, we commit all these things to you this morning and pray that you will soften our hearts as Dan comes to preach from your word. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. We're now going to read from Psalm 146 together. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirits departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. He gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. G'day, RPAC. It's wonderful to be gathered again this morning. It's Dan here, one of the pastors of RPAC Church. Um, I'm just going to pray that God would help us to understand his word this morning. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that through it, we can be changed and transformed into Christ's likeness and be challenged. Uh, Father, may we be challenged this morning to trust you and not human beings, to trust you who can save and not human beings who can't. Amen. Our psalm this morning begins in a similar fashion to a couple of the psalms we've been looking at recently. It begins with drawing our hearts to praise. A couple of weeks ago, it was in Psalm 103, and in that psalm, it started, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and it said, All my inmost being, praise his holy name. The idea being that uh, as a follower of Christ, I might uh, offer my whole life and everything that I am and do uh, can be offered as, as praise to God. Um, this psalm begins slightly differently. This psalm begins, praise the Lord, O my soul. I, and then it says, I will praise the Lord, not all my inmost being, but it says, I will praise the Lord with all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. So the prayer of this psalm is a prayer of endurance. It's a prayer of perseverance. Not only will I be God's child praising him today, but my commitment, my prayer is that I will be praising him tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and so on and so forth until I one day take my last breath. That's what the psalmist is praying will happen for him. Uh, but in this psalm, 
He, he asks a question of his own heart. And the question that he asks of himself isn't, will I or won't I praise God every day for the rest of my life? The question that he asks is rather a question of trust. Who will I trust today and who will I trust tomorrow? Will I trust God to provide for me and to protect me and to save me? Or will I look to people and to things to be my provision and my salvation and my protection? So who do I trust? Do I trust God or do I trust people? Now, let's read Psalm 146 verses 1 to 4 as he asks this very question. He says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. He says, I'll praise the Lord all my life. I'll sing praise to God as long as I live. And then he says, do not put your trust in human beings. Sorry, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Now, I read that word princes. And I wondered, hmm, who are the princes that the psalmist is probably referring to? Like when he uses the word princes, what kind of people is he thinking of? Is the application of this psalm that all princes are just not to be trusted? Harry, William, sorry guys, you just can't be trusted. The Bible says so. Actually, no, that's not the application of this psalm. Um, but I did want to know what kinds of princes the psalmist might be referring to when he uses that word. And so what I want to do is take us to Isaiah chapters 36 to 39. In Isaiah chapters 36 to 39, there's a story of Israel and Jerusalem being attacked. Jerusalem being besieged. In this story, there's a guy who's the king of Israel. And his name is Hezekiah. In Israel, they're being attacked by the Assyrian Empire, by the Assyrian Empire and their king, who was a guy named Sennacherib. Now, Sennacherib and his forces, they've been traveling around the ancient world, conquering nation after nation, and then finally they come to Judah. And by the time we get to our part of the story, the Assyrians, they have conquered every town and every city of Judah, except for Jerusalem. Jerusalem with its big walls. Jerusalem's the only city that still stands before Sennacherib and his hundreds of thousands of warriors and their swords and their chariots and their shields. The Assyrians, they surround Jerusalem. And not unlike in our psalm, but there's an overarching question in this story. And the question is, in this time of such darkness and such danger, with the Assyrians all around about to attack Jerusalem, who will Hezekiah and the Israelites trust. That's the question of the story. Who will they trust? Will they trust their God to provide for and to protect and to save them? Or, will, or, or is Hezekiah and the Israelites going to get on their hands and knees and walk beyond the city walls and beg the Assyrians for mercy? Are they going to trust the Assyrians or are they going to trust God? And so the scene is set. On the one side is Jerusalem and the soldiers of Jerusalem are, are atop its walls. They're looking down outside of Jerusalem at hundreds of thousands of hardened Assyrian warriors. So there's the scene, Jerusalem, its walls, its soldiers atop the walls and hundreds of thousands of Assyrians. And from out of that massive bodies of the Assyrian army steps the field commander of the Assyrian army. And this is what he says. So this is what it says uh, in Isaiah, then the field commander, he stands and he calls out in Hebrew to the Israelite soldiers standing on the wall. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of of the king of Assyria. He, he's saying, the field commander is saying this to the soldiers of the wall, to the people living in Jerusalem. He says, do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says the Lord will deliver us. In other words, don't trust the Lord. Don't trust God. The field commander goes on to make many, many promises of the things that they'll receive if they trust Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, instead of trusting their Lord. I have to ask you, what do you think you would do if you were one of the soldiers on the top of the wall? 
If you were one of the soldiers looking down at all of those Assyrians about to come in and attack you, do you think that you would trust God? Or do you think that you might be tempted to get off that wall and trust in this field commander instead? Do you imagine that you would have the strength and courage and conviction to trust God? Even as you looked at those hundreds of thousands of warriors stood before you, ready to come and kill you and your family. Do you think you'd be able to trust God? I know for me, it's far easier often to be more concerned with the physical here and now than with the truth of the awesome power of God. So what do you think you would do? Would you, would you trust the, the field commander in front of you? Or would you trust the God that you pray to? Now, the story goes on, and what does Hezekiah do? He's faced with this question. Who will I trust? Will I trust God or will I trust Sennacherib? And in the end, the story ends well for him. He does trust God. He does not trust Sennacherib. And in his trust of the Lord, he prays to God for help. And this is what he says. Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, he's praying to God. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to all these peoples and their lands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. Hezekiah prays this prayer, and shortly after, Praying this prayer, an angel of the Lord is sent out to the Assyrian army, and God, through this angel, wipes out 185,000 of Sennacherib's men. And then it says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, because all of these men had been killed, breaks camp, he withdraws, and he returns to Nineveh, defeated. My goodness, Hezekiah, be praised to the Lord, and the Lord wipes out Hezekiah's enemies. He saves Jerusalem. He delivers his people. And why are we talking about this story? The story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib? Well, it's because our psalmist says, do not put your trust in princes. When he says the word princes, he certainly would have been thinking of people like Sennacherib or the pharaohs of Egypt or the kings of Babylon. Powerful, scary men. But the psalmist knows that to trust those guys, powerful as they may seem, scary as they may be, regardless of the promises that they may make, the psalmist knows that to trust them instead of God would be the dumbest thing in the world. The psalmist writes, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, when they die, they return to the ground, and on that very day their plans come to nothing. And in the end of the story, Sennacherib is murdered by his sons in his home. And within 70 years, the Assyrian Empire has ceased to exist as a political entity. Human beings, no matter how impressive they may seem, no matter how powerful they may be, no no matter the claims and promises they make, human beings are not ultimately to be trusted. They're not ultimately worthy of our trust and they cannot save us. In the end, they'll be dead like everyone else and their plans will come to nothing. Unlike God. As Psalm says, blessed are those, not the ones who trust in human beings, but blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. And it goes on to list all of the wonderful attributes of God, maker of heaven and earth, uh, upholder um, of the cause of the oppressed. He feeds the hungry, he sets prisoners free, he gives sight to the blind, and it goes on and on and on. All of the wonderful uh, attributes of God, all of the reasons one should put their trust in God. And the question of this psalm is, remember, um, the psalmist says, I will praise God with all my life. But the question is, will I trust in God or will I trust in human beings? And the psalmist, he's encouraging himself. He urges himself in the psalm. Don't trust in human beings who cannot save and whose plans come to nothing, but trust in your God. Come on, soul. Come on me. Trust in God. 
not in human beings. God is the creator. God is the upholder. God is the provider, the liberator, the healer, the sustainer, the just king and judge. And unlike people whose reign will always end, God's never will. Come on, soul. Trust God, not people. He provides. He protects. He saves. Trust him. The question of the psalm is, who will you trust? And it is also the same question I have for all of you this morning. In whom or what do you place your trust? There's another great story in the New Testament. And Paul is with a guy called Barnabas, and they're asking exactly the same kinds of questions of people there. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas, they're traveling together, traveling from city to city, and they're preaching the gospel. And they're telling people to put their trust in Jesus. They're telling people that Jesus will forgive them of their sin and that God will then provide for them and protect them and save them in this life and the next. And then Paul and Barnabas, they're they're traveling around the ancient world, they're preaching this message and they come to this city called Lystra. And Paul in this city comes across a man. He's a man who has never in his life walked. He's called lame in the story. He's never in his life walked and Paul sees him and he sees that he has faith. And Paul heals this man. This man gets up from the ground and takes the first steps he has ever taken in his entire life. When Paul does this, there's a crowd watching and the crowd sees. Now, what's Paul hoping for them, for the crowd? What's he hoping that they will do? What Paul's hoping is that they will see God's power displayed in the healing of this man. And that they will hear the message that Paul and the Barnabas are preaching about the love and forgiveness and power of God and uh, what they can have in him if they put their trust in Jesus. Paul hopes they'll see what he did in healing this guy, that they'll hear the message and that they will then put their trust in Jesus. But what do they do? Instead, they see Paul heal this man and then they go, this guy, Paul, is amazing. And Barnabas, they just healed this guy who's never walked before. They are incredible people. They must be gods themselves. And they're so convinced that Paul and Barnabas must be gods themselves that they call Barnabas Zeus, as though Zeus was manifest in human form in Barnabas. And they call Paul Hermes, as though the god, the Greek god Hermes was manifest in, in Paul. And the priest of the, 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 the temple of Zeus goes and gets bulls and wreaths and comes to offer sacrifices before Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they are gods. Now, when Paul and Barnabas hear about this, that these people are hoping to worship them, not God, they're horrified. Because what did Paul want from them? Paul wanted people to see God's power and to hear about the truth and love of Jesus. And he wanted them to see the power of God, hear the message, and to put their trust in Jesus. And what have they done? They have not put their trust in God, but they've put their trust in human beings instead. We are still so prone to be like the Lyconians in this way, aren't we? How quickly do we rush to put our trust in people and things and promises and the claims that they make upon our lives? To put our trust in our relationships, to put our trust in our loved ones, to put our trust in our money, to put our trust in our success, to put our trust in our politics and our political agendas and our philosophies and to hope that all of these things might provide for us or protect us or save us in some kind of a way, except the truth is that they cannot save us. Only God can. They cannot save us. Only God can. A romantic relationship cannot save me in the way that God can. My money, money can't save me in the way that God can. Philosophies and politics can't save me in the way that God can. Um, these are examples, they're just a few examples of what would be an infinite number of examples of princes of this world in whom we might put our trust in instead of God. We all struggle to not to run to our own personal list of princes, don't we? To not run to our own personal list of people and things who we believe might fix the problems within and without us. The Laconians, they saw Paul and Barnabas, what they could do, but they did not hear what they were saying. And so they rushed to put their trust in Paul and Barnabas and offer sacrifices before them. 
But when Paul and Barnabas hear that this has happened, they're horrified. And then Paul responds to them. And when he does, what does he quote? He quotes Psalm 146. Read with me from Acts 14 from verse 14. When the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out into the crowd saying, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news. What we're doing is we're telling you to turn away from these worthless things, like worshipping people like us. Turn from that to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And there's the quote from Psalm 146. Trust God. Stop trusting in people like us. Ultimately, the crowd turns against Paul and they stone him. And they stone him so badly that he nearly dies. Now, I didn't realize this before, but Paul nearly dies in Acts 14. This is nearly the end of his ministry. Many in the crowd that day, they decided not to put their trust in Jesus. Many chose rather to trust in human beings, in the princes of this world who cannot save, whose works would ultimately come to nothing. But some number of them did choose to trust Jesus. Some number of them did put their trust in him. Paul and Barnabas, they leave that city and then they come back. And it says that Paul and Barnabas, when they came back to Lystra, they appointed elders in each church. And with prayer and fasting, they committed those elders to the Lord, to the Lord in whom they put their trust. There were two groups of people. There were a group of people who chose to trust in human beings and in things that could not save. And there was another group of people who chose to put their trust in Jesus. Now, for all of you listening to this sermon, who do you trust? Where do you look ultimately for your provision and for your protection and salvation? Because the message of Psalm 146 is the same message that I have for all of you. Which is that your relationships, your money, your politics, your success, your career, the gurus of this world cannot save you. Some of these things might be very good. None of them can save you. Only God can. They cannot save you from your greatest need, which is to be forgiven of your sin, restored to a good and right relationship with God and saved from the judgment and hell that you deserve. And not only do the princes of this world, human beings who are not to be trusted, not provide you with your greatest need. They're not even good at meeting the needs that we have in this life. Ultimately, those people and things will pass away in all of their energy and efforts and plans. And all of the time and worship that you might offer unto them will come to nothing. Why would we put our trust in princes and human beings who cannot save? When we could put our trust in the King, Jesus and the creator of the universe, who can save. Our God is so worthy of our trust. He made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them. And he does so much else for us on top of that. Such is his love, such is his power, such is his friendship and kindness to us. And so... You should, I needed to once, I had to, as a matter of necessity. We have to trust in Jesus. We have to accept his love, accept his forgiveness. We have to become not a child of this sinful world, but instead to become a child of God and become a part of his family. You can trust God with your life. And if you've already done that in your life, for us, for those of us who are Christians, this psalm is very much still for us. While we have put our trust in Jesus and we are safe and secure in his love, we're still just as prone to run to the princes of this world, aren't we? I still struggle to trust that I need God's strength more than I need uh, a cup of coffee for energy. And I still struggle to trust God when it comes to feeling joy and contentment in my life. I struggle not to just run to meaningless distraction and fun and entertaining things rather than to remember that true joy and contentment lies in following him and serving him with my whole life. I still struggle sometimes to trust God with my health. I mean, it's not that I shouldn't call the doctor, but I, I sometimes forget even to talk to God about it before I do. 
I still struggle to trust God with my family sometimes. To remember that the best thing I can do for my wife and children is not to provide for them. It's not to give them everything they want or need. It's not to uh, make sure that they're always happy. But the most important thing that I can do for them is to be helping them to trust, not in me, to rely not on me, but rather to rely on and to trust in the Lord, to find their satisfaction in him. Now, we all have our own princes, our own subjects of trust in this list. Things and people that we know threaten to creep above our trust in God. And it is our duty. It is our joy. It is our right praise to do everything in our power to ensure that our trust sits with the only one who can save. With the only one whose plans last beyond the span of a human life. Let's be like Hezekiah. Let's be like the early church. And trust that it is God who comes to our rescue, who delivers us. And let's trust him with our whole lives. Not just today, but may we as the psalmist praise, praise God with um, all, all of our lives. May we praise him as long as we live day after day. May we do that. No. 
darkest nights My broken soul's delight No other name but Jesus Thanks, Dan, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, join us after church on Zoom, and I'll keep this short and sweet. Until next time, in the name of Christ, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.